I'm Jim. Welcome to my shop slash classroom slash lab slash office slash everything on off days. Um, today, in the spirit of keeping things quick and short and tight, I want to hit 10 myths about lift and airfoil in about 10 minutes. The mother of all myths, airfoils have to be curved on the top and flat on the bottom to generate lift. Some airfoils, they are shaped like the cartoon airfoils. Most of those date back to between 1918 and the early 1930s, late 1920s. More modern airfoils, 1930s, okay, nice curve under here. 1970s, curves all over the place on the bottom. Myth number two, boyfriend, girlfriend air molecules have to get to the trailing edge food court at the same time. Uh, if that were true, Airplanes as we knew of them couldn't fly. So, yeah, link in the description. I'm not going to waste time on that one. Myth number three, Newton's laws do not explain the low pressure on the top of an airfoil. You have to use Bernoulli. Let me give you an analogy. Suppose I told you that uh, you could drive from Chattanooga, Tennessee down to Tampa, Florida on I-75. You can drive from Detroit, Michigan down to Chattanooga, Tennessee on I-75. Would you believe me if I told you you couldn't drive from Detroit to Tampa? No, of course not. Now, given if you want to say that Bernoulli's law explains the low pressure on the top, and I can show you that Newton's laws explain Bernoulli's laws, I got another video that does that, would you, why would you believe somebody who says that Newton's laws don't explain the low pressure on the top? Which leads me to Newton versus Bernoulli. Popular topic among pilots for whatever reason, and pilots like to argue the two like there's some um, actual fundamental difference. Now, Newton's law is generally more broadly applicable. It applies to the motion of the planets, trains leaving Chicago's, apples dropping from trees, where Bernoulli is limited to flow along a streamline in an ideal fluid, but there is no versus. There is no 60-40 distribution of lift or whatever the numbers are like that. Anything Bernoulli explains, Newton can explain. It takes nine and a half hours to drive from Detroit to Chattanooga, and it takes 10 minutes and 24 seconds to do the algebra to get from Newton's laws to Bernoulli's equation. Myth number five. Bernoulli's equation actually explains the low pressure on top of the wing. Bernoulli's equation is all about the conservation of energy along a streamline trade-off between potential energy and kinetic energy. Now, if you are given the higher velocity of the air over the top of the airfoil, Bernoulli explains the lower pressure, but Bernoulli does not explain why the airflow is faster. Not no way, not no how. And it's the attempts to explain that fast airflow velocity that lead us to some of the nonsense like myth number two and myth number seven, which is coming up in a couple myths. Which brings up myth number six. Somehow this is supposed to demonstrate Bernoulli's principle. The myth claims that this jet of air is moving faster, therefore the pressure must be lower and it pulls the paper up. non -essensa. You can't assume that just because it's faster it's a lower pressure because the total pressures are different. Bernoulli talks about conservation of pressure along a streamline, not the relationship between two streamlines that originate at different pressures and different conditions. And in fact, this demonstration completely violates all the principles that make Bernoulli's principle valid. Let me demonstrate. Holding this paper underneath this, as you saw, we transferred energy from that jet of air coming out of that nozzle to the piece of paper and sent it flying, completely violating the assumptions that make Bernoulli's equation valid. That demonstration actually demonstrates two different things. It demonstrates that air has viscosity, contrary to the assumptions of Bernoulli's equation, and energy is transferred between streamlines. And the other thing it demonstrates is people don't understand Bernoulli's equation. But enough about Bernoulli, how about some Newtonian myths? Number seven, bottom bouncing balls of air. Uh, the myth is that somehow air molecules come along and they bounce off the bottom of the wing and that's transferring momentum and that's giving some Newtonian component of lift. A couple few problems with that, aside from the fact it's completely wrong. In real life, air doesn't go like this, right? It curves along and it starts changing its trajectory even before it gets to the airfoil. And what about above the wing where Newton's laws explain the low pressure? It's not because of bouncing balls of air, which leads us to one of the corollaries of that myth, number eight. Pressure alone does not explain lift. 
and that's usually when we start talking about bottom bouncing balls of air. The definition of pressure is the normal force per unit area exerted by molecules of a fluid, gas or air, hitting the surface. That's the definition. So if we have molecules of air bouncing off the bottom, that is pressure. Don't tell me it's not pressure, it's somehow magical, okay? Just like the air molecules bouncing off the top, that's pressure. So pressure, that starts with P, which rhymes with T, which stands for, that's all you got, folks. And speaking of pressure, we got myth number nine. An airfoil works like a Venturi. There's three things, at least three things wrong with that myth. Number one, an airfoil doesn't look like this cross section of a Venturi. Number two, looking at these images from a video, the airflow around the foil by itself with upwash in front and downwash in the back is nothing like the airflow around that wing paired up with another airfoil to make this double wing Venturi, where here you, instead of having upwash in the front, you have downwash in the front, upwash in the back, not even close in terms of modeling the actual airflow of a wing in real life. And big problem number three, the idea that somehow the flow over the top squeezes the streamlines and that makes it speed up and that generates suction. Uh, if that were true, when you put the flaps down, you're going to be squeezing airflow underneath the wing and that should create a low pressure suction and reduce lift. You can't be more wrong than predicting the exact opposite of what happens in real life. Myth number 10. Scientists and engineers don't understand what causes lift. To quote John D. Anderson Jr., there is no simple one-liner, but that doesn't mean that it's not understood. Yes, there is a prize you can get if you can explain that there is, in fact, a solution to the Navier-Stokes equation, and yes, there's work you can do on turbulence and vortex shedding, but the basic concepts of what generates lifts, every day engineers are designing aircraft and airfoils and things and predicting the results and getting the results they're predicting and using computational fluid dynamics and all that stuff. And it all just works because people do, in fact, understand it. The only real not well understood thing is the best way to explain complicated subjects like fluid dynamics to people without resorting to math. Now for a bonus myth. Supposedly somewhere at some time, some scientist or aerodynamicist pr proved using the laws of aerodynamics that a bumblebee can't fly. Now what is true, okay, if you take the weight of the bumblebee, the wing area of the bumblebee, and you apply lift coefficients that you get out of a wind tunnel when you're testing normal airfoil sections for aircraft, and you apply all those numbers and you can prove, yeah, an air, a bumblebee can't fly, there's not enough lift. There's, a, some, there's problems with that analysis. One of the big ones is Reynolds number, okay? Uh, Reynolds number relates size and speed and inertia and viscosity to get dynamic similarity. Uh, to oversimplify, at high Reynolds number, inertial effects are dominating. At low Reynolds number, viscosity is king. Aircraft and the data you collect in wind tunnels, we're talking Reynolds number in the order of millions, several millions, okay? Bumblebees operate at Reynolds numbers around a hundred-ish or so. Huge, huge difference. At Bumblebee Reynolds numbers, viscosity is king. Okay? It's like swimming in syrup. You can't take the numbers and data from aircraft stuff and apply it to a bumblebee. And any real scientist or real, real aerodynamicist should know that. With that, thanks for watching. I hope you found it at least entertaining, and I'll catch you on the flip side.